Good day, everybody. How are you all? Today, we are going to talk about descriptive statistics. So I will share my computer screen with you. So this is a descriptive statistics chapter on descriptive statistics, and we're going to talk about stem and leaf graphs, line graphs, and bar graphs initially. <clears throat> One simple graph, the stem and leaf graph, or the stem plot, comes from the field of exploratory data analysis. It is a good choice when the data sets are small. To create the plot, Divide each observation of data into a stem and a leaf. The leaf consists of the final significant digit. For example, 23 has stem 2 and leaf 3. The number 432 has stem 43 and leaf 2. So you note in both cases, the last digit becomes the leaf and the remaining digits are stems. Likewise, the number 5,432 has leaf, of course, of 2 and stem of 543. The decimal 9.3 has stem 9 and leaf 3. While the stems in a vertical, in a vertical line from smallest, uh, I mean, write the stems in a vertical line from the smallest to the largest. Draw a vertical line to the right of the stems. Okay, then uh, write the leaves in increasing order next to their corresponding stem. The stem plot is a quick way to graph data and gives an exact picture of the data. You want to look for an overall pattern and any outliers. An outlier is an observation of data that does not fit the rest of the data. It is sometimes called an extreme value. When you graph an outlier, it will appear not to fit the pattern of the graph. Some outliers were due to mistakes, for example, writing down 50 instead of 500, while others may indicate that something unusual is happening. It takes some background information to explain outliers, so we'll cover them in more detail later. For Susan Dean's spring pre-calculus class, scores for the first exam are as follows, smallest to the largest, okay? So our stem will start from three and end at 10. So the first number 33 has a stem of three, leaf of three, okay? 42 next number has a stem of four, leaf of two. Next number, stem of four, leaf of nine. Then again, four and stem of four and leaf of nine and so forth. The stem plot shows that the most scores fail in the 60s. Why? Because there are a lot of entries in the stem with six. 70s also quite a bit, 80s quite a bit, but majority in 60s and 90s. Okay. Eight of the 31 scores were approximately or approximately 26%. 8 divided by 31 is 0.26. You multiply that by 100 to get 26%. Okay. So 8 of the 8 out of the 31 scores are approximately or approximately 26% were in the 90s or 100, a fairly high number of A's. So you look at the stem nine, how many entries are there? There are seven leaves there, okay, in the stem of nine. And in the stem of 10, there is one leaf. So total in nine, st with stem of nine and stem of 10, are uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Eight out of 31 students got A's, okay? A side-by-side, Stem and leaf plot 
allows a comparison of the two data sets in two columns. In a side-by-side -side stem and leaf plot, two sets of leaves share the same step. The leaves are left are to the left and to the right of the stem. So the stem is in the middle. Table 2.4 and 2.5, table 2.5 show the ages of the precedents at the inauguration and at their death. Construct a side-by-side -side stem and leaf plot of his death. So on the left, you have age at ages at innovation. I mean, uh, sorry, at inauguration. Ages at inauguration. So the lowest stem is four. The highest stem is for inauguration is 60s. And you have quite a bit, actually the maximum number of entries in the stem, uh, five. Maximum number of leaves in the stem, five. Then you look at the ages of death and you see the maximum number of entries or leaves in the stem of six. Okay. So here are the original data set. So again, we can construct a stem and leaf plot uh, from this data set. I'll provide some information on the uh, on links to YouTube videos where I've done similar problems. Basically here, the lowest stem is three. Uh, for example, in the stem three, the leaves are two, two, three, four, eight. Okay, the highest number of uh, the highest leaf is six and number of leaves in six with stem of six is zero and one. Similarly, if you look at the stem of five, there are quite a bit of entries in five or leaves in five, zero, zero, one, two, 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 three, four, six, and two sevens. Okay. Okay. Another type of graph that is useful for specific data is called a line graph. The x-axis of the horizontal axis consists of the data values, okay, and the y values versus uh, vertical axis consists of frequency points, okay. The frequency points are connected using the segments, line segments, okay. So basically, you have number of times teenager is reminded, okay. And that becomes your X. And so the first column of data, number of times teenager is reminded, starts from zero up until five, five data points. Or uh, one, two, three, four, five, six data points, actually. So five X values and corresponding five Y values. And you uh, plot them as an ordered pair of X, Y. X is the number of years, uh, number of times teenager is reminded. Teenage is reminded and frequency as y, paired data point. It's called line graph. Okay. Bar graphs consist of bars that are separated from each other. The bars can be rectangles or they can be rectangular boxes used in three-dimensional plots and they can be vertical or horizontal. By the end of 2011, Facebook had over for 140 million users in the United States. Table 2.9 shows the three age groups, the number of users in the age group and the proportion of users in age group. A bar graph of this data is shown below. So on the horizontal axis, you have the three age groups, okay? 13 to 15, 25 to 44, and 45 to 64, okay? On the vertical axis, they have plotted the percentage of the total users for each category. So, for example, in the age group 13 to 25, proportion was 46% and it has the highest height of that bar. The next highest is 16 to 44, 26 to 44, and its height is 38%. And then the next one from 45 to 64, its height is 19%. Okay. Now we are going to talk about histograms, frequency polygons, and time series graphs. A histogram consists of contiguous adjoining boxes. It has both a horizontal axis and a vertical axis. 
Adjoining boxes means there is no gap between the vertical boxes or vertical rectangles. The horizontal axis is labeled what the data represents. For instance, distance from your home to school. The vertical axis is labeled either frequency or relative frequency or percent frequency or probability. The graph will have the same shape with either label. The histogram, like the stain plot, can give you the shape of the data, the center, and the spread of the data. To construct a histogram, first decide how many bars or intervals, also called classes, represent the data. Many histograms consist of 5 to 15 bars or classes for clarity. Choose a starting point for the first interval to be less than the smallest data value. A convenient starting point is the lower value carried out to one more decimal place than the value with the most decimal places. For example, if the value of the most low, uh, decimal places is 6.1 and this is the smallest value, a convenient starting point is 6.05, which is 6.1 minus 0 0.05 is 6.05. If all data happen to be integers and the smallest value is zero, then a convenient starting point is, uh, the smallest value is two then the convenient starting point is 1.5. 2 minus 0 0.5 is 1.5. Also, when the starting point and other boundaries are carried to one additional data place, decimal place, no data value will fall on a boundary. Okay. Next, calculate the width of each bar or class interval. To calculate this width, subtract the starting point from the ending value and divide by the number of bars. You must choose the number of bars you desire. A rule of thumb is to have five to six bars. Okay. The following data are the heights in inches to the nearest half inch of 100 male semi-professional soccer players. The heights are continuous data since height is measured, okay? The smallest data value is 60, okay? Since the data with the most decimal places has one decimal, for instance, 61.5, we want to our starting point to have two decimal places. Since the number is 0 0.5, 0 0.05, 0 0.005, etc. are convenient numbers. Use 0 0.05 and subtract it from 60, the smallest value for the convenient starting point. So the starting point becomes 60 minus 0 0.05. Why did we take two places of decimal? Why did we subtract 0 0.05 instead of 0 0.5? Because the lowest, because the most number of decimal places is one, such as 61.5. That's the reason. So 59.95, which is more precise than say 61.5 by one decimal place, the starting point is then 59.95. The largest value is 74. So 74 plus 0 0.05 is 74.05 is the ending value. Next, calculate the width of each bar or class interval. To calculate this width, subtract the starting point from the ending value, starting point from the ending value, and divide by the number of bars. You must choose the number of bars you desire. Suppose you choose eight bars. Note, we will round up two and make each bar a class. So, okay. We will uh, round up to two and make each bar or class interval two units width. Rounding up to two is one of the way to prevent a value from falling on a boundary. Rounding up to the next number is often necessary if it goes against the standard rule of rounding. For, a, for this example, using 1.76 as the width would not would also work. A guideline that is followed by some of the uh, by some for number of bars or class interval is to take the six square root of the number of data values and then round to the nearest whole number if necessary. For example, if there are 150 data values of data, take the square root of 150 and round to 12 bars or intervals. Create the boundaries by adding the width to the starting point. 
so on to create the total number of classes needed. So 59.95 plus 2. So class width is becoming 2 now. Okay. And the heights of 60 to 61.5 inches are in the interval 59.95 to 61.95. The heights that are 63.5 are in the interval 61.95 to 63.95. Okay. The heights that are 64 through 64.5 are in the next class from 63.95 to 66.95. Notice the classes are on the horizontal axis. The vertical axis is relative frequency, which is the frequency in each class divided by total number of frequencies. The following and this type of diagram where the adjoining rectangles or adjacent rectangles, vertical rectangles are touching each other are called a histogram. The following is histogram display the heights on the x-axis and the relative frequency on the y-axis or the vertical axis. The following data shoe sizes of 50 male students. The sizes are discrete data since shoe size is measured in whole and half units only. Okay, Construct a histogram and calculate the width of each bar of class interval. Suppose you choose six bars. Okay. And uh, let's uh, go through this problem. Create a histogram for the following data. Uh, the number of books bought by 50 part-time college students at ABC College. Uh, <coughs> the number of books bought by 50 part-time students at ABC College. So uh, create a histogram for the following data. The number of books bought by 50 part-time college students at ABC College. Okay, part-time ABC college. The number of books is discrete data since books are counted. 11 students by one book, 10 students by two books, 1, 1, 1 means 11 students. How many students bought one book? How many students bought two books? 16 students by three books and five students, uh, uh, six students by four books, five students by five books, two students by six books. Because the data are integers, Subtract 0 0.5 from 1, the smallest data value. <clears throat> 1 is the smallest data value from which we will subtract 0 0.5. And we will add 0 0.5 to 6, which is the largest data value. Then the starting point is 0 0.5 and the ending value is 6.5. Next, calculate the width of each bar or class interval. If the data are discrete and there are not too many different values, a width that places the data values in the middle of the bar or class interval is the most convenient. Since the data consists of the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, and the starting point is 0. 0.5, a width of 1, a width of 1 places a width of 1 places the 1 in the middle of the interval 0. 0.5 to 1.5. The 2 in the middle of the interval from 1.5 to 2.5. The 3 in the middle of the interval from 2.5 to 3.5 and so on. So here is your diagram. So you have the number of books on the horizontal axis and the frequency on the vertical axis. This is a frequency histogram. Okay. So they, here they show you how to do it in TI-84 calculator. <clears throat> so we have worked out this problem in a YouTube video, which I'll share the link with you. <clears throat> so what are frequency polygons? Frequency polygons are analogous to line graphs and just as line graphs make continuous data visually easy to interpret, so to do frequency polygons. To construct a frequency polygons, the first exam, First, examine the data and decide on the number of intervals or class intervals to use on the x-axis and y-axis. After choosing the appropriate ranges, begin plotting the data points. After all the data points are plotted, draw line segments to connect them. So this is your frequency polygon. You have scores, okay? On the horizontal axis, going from 44.5, the first class is from 44.5 to 54.5. Okay. 
then 54.5 to 64.5. Okay. So it's actually the diagram is wrong. It's starting from 49.5 on the horizontal axis to 54.5. And then from 54 point, so it's starting from 44.5 on the horizontal axis going up to 54.5. And <clears throat> so at 54.5, which is the middle of the uh, group or the uh, class, so between 44.5 to uh, 54.5, then 54.5 to 64.5. Okay, so what they have done is basically plotted the midpoint of each class. The midpoint of the first class between 49.5 to 59.5 to 59.5. So if you add the lower bound 49.5 to the upper bound 59.5, it is 109. Divide that by 2, you get 54.5. So at 54.5, the frequency is 5. Okay. Let's take the middle of the next class, which is between 59.5 plus 69.5, lower bound plus upper bound, divided by 2 is 64.5, and the frequency is 15. Okay. So you have 64.5, and the frequency is 15. Okay. So frequency is 10. So 64.5 frequency is 10. So let me go through you again. Forget about 44.5. 54.5 on the horizontal axis. How did they get, come up with this? They added 49.5 plus 59.5. 49.5 is the lower bound of the first class. To that, they add the upper bound of the first class, which is 59.5. Sum of the two upper lower bound and upper bound is 109. Divide that by two, it becomes 54.5. So they took the midpoint as the x value, 54.5, y value, 5 as the frequency. That's how you get the first dot, not the one on the horizontal axis. Next one, what did they do? They took the middle of 59.5 and 69.5, which is 64.5, which is the X value corresponding Y value. The frequency in that class is 10 and so forth. Next one will be 74.5 frequency Y value is 30. Okay. And next one between 79.5 and 89.5, its midpoint is 84.5 and the frequency is 40, okay? And then you have the midpoint of 89.5 and 98.5 or 99.5, 49.5 plus 99.5. If you do it on the calculator, 49.5 plus 99.5, the sum is 149, divide that by two is 74.5, okay? 74. 4.5 and the corresponding y value is the frequency in that class is 15. So accepting the points on the horizontal axis, what you have done is the midpoint of each class is the x value, corresponding frequency is the y value. And you connect these dots up to the one before the last point. Then how did you get these last two points? Well, you know the midpoint of the last class is 94.5. To that, you add another 10 because 10 is your class interval. You get 104.5 and there's no frequency at that. So you end the curve at y-axis on the right. Similarly, on the left, you know the midpoint of the first class is 54.5. To that, from that, you subtract 10, 10 being the class width. You get 44.5. There's no frequency value on that. So you end the graph on the x-axis and you connect this x. Uh, connect all the x and y values together. So you find a starting point at the x-axis, you find an ending point on the x-axis too, okay?
and this is called a frequency polygon. Okay. To construct a time series graph, we must look at both pieces of our paired data set. We start with standard Cartesian coordinate system, that is XY system. The horizontal axis is used to plot the date or time increments, and the vertical axis is used to plot the values of the variable that we are measuring. By doing this, we make each point on the graph correspond to data, to a date and a measured quantity. The points on the graph are typically connected by straight lines in the order in which they occur. So here are some data, American Consumer Price Index. For 10 years, construct a time series graph. And it looks like this. Time series graphs, times is on the horizontal axis. Whatever you uh, uh, quantity you are plotting is on the vertical axis. The time series graphs are important tools in various applications of statistics. When recording values of the same variable over an extended period of time, sometimes it is difficult to discern any trend or pattern. However, once the same uh, data values are displayed graphically, some features jump out. Time series graphs make trends easy to form. You're looking for patterns or change in data over time. Okay. So now we will talk about how to measure certain location of the data, okay? The median is a, is a number that measures the center of the data. You can think of the median as the middle value, but it does not actually have to be one of the observed values. It is a number that separates the ordered data into halves. Half the values are the same num number or smaller than the median and half the values are the same number or larger than the median. The median capital M is called both the second quartile and the 50th percentile. So 50% of the numbers are at the median or below the median and 50% of the numbers are at the median or above the median. The common measures of locations are quartiles and percentiles. Percentiles divide ordered data into hundreds. To score the 90th percentile of an exam does not mean necessarily that you receive 90% on a test. It means that 90% of the state's test scores are the same or less than your score, and 10% of the test scores are the same or greater than your test score. To calculate percentiles, the data must be ordered from smallest to largest. The first quartile Q1 is the middle value of the lower half of the data and the third quartile Q3 is the middle value of the upper half of the data. The first quartile Q1 is the same as the 25th percentile and the third quartile Q3 is the same as the 75th percentile. Quarters, quartiles may or may not be part of the data. To calculate quartiles, the data must be ordered from smallest to largest. K is the kth percentile. It may or may not be part of the data. I is the index ranking position of the data value. N is the total number of data. Order the data from smallest to largest. Calculate the I. I is K, whatever percentile you are looking for. If it is 20, then K is 20 divided by 100 times N plus 1. If i is an integer, the kth percentile is the data in the ith position in the ordered set of the data. If i is not an integer, then round it up, then round i up and round i down to the nearest integer. Average the two data values in these two positions in the ordered data set. Okay, so we have to find the 70th percentile. Okay. So remember the rule, it is 70 divided by 100 multiplied by n plus 1. My sample size is 29. 29 plus 1 is 30. So 30 multiplied by 70 divided by 100 is 21. Okay, so we are looking for the number in the 21st position which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. So the number in the 21st position is 64. So 64 is the 70th percentile. 
That means 70% of the numbers are below 64 and 30% above 64. Next is find the 83rd percentile. So 83 divided by 100 multiplied by 30. 29 plus 1 is 30. Okay. It's a number in the 24.9 position. So we will look at the number in the 25th position, 24th position and average it out. So we already know. Let's uh, look at the number in the 24th position. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. Number in the 24th position is 71. Number in the 25th position is 72. So we will add 71 plus 72, which is 143. Divide that by 2 is 71.5. So 71.5 represents the 83rd percentile. That means 83% of the numbers are below 71.5 and 17% above it. Okay and so forth. Order the data from smallest to largest. X is the number of data values counting from the bottom of the data list uh, up to but not including the data value from which you want to find the percentile. The number of data values equal to the data value for Y is the number of data values equal to the data values for which you want to find the percentile. N is the total number of data. So calculate X plus 0.5. What is X? Number of data values counting from the bottom, bottom of the data list up to the point but not including the data value. So X plus 0.5 Y. What is Y? Y is the number of values equal to the data value for which you want to find the, <coughs> find the percentile. N is your total number of data. Okay. Find the percentile for 58. So how many numbers are below? Um, 58 in the data set. Below 58. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So 18 are below 58. Okay. So the formula is X, the number of data values counting from the bottom of the data list up to but not including the data value for which, which is 18. Y is the number of values equal to the data value for which you want to find the percentile, which in this case is 19. So 8 and what is the total number of values in the data set? 29. Okay. So 89, 18 for X plus 0.5 times 19 is 27.5. Now divide that by 29, okay? And then multiply it to the 100, okay? So the answer to the question is percentile for 58. 58 is in the 94th percentile. If I've done it correctly, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. And 58 is in the 18th position. So it is 18 plus 0.5 times 19. Okay. So it is 27.5 divided by, you know, can, let me see the total number. So 18, 19, 18, uh, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28. Yes. So it is in the 95th percentile. Okay. Okay. And I will show you some videos also, YouTube video links. Find the 80th percentile, same thing. When they're writing the interpretation of a percentile in context of the given data, the center should contain the following information. Information about the context of the situation being considered, the data value, value of the variable that represents the percentile, 
the percent of individuals or items with data values below the percentile, the percent of individuals or items with data values above the percentile. Okay. Now we are talking about interquartile range. It's called IQR, which is Q3 minus Q1. So it is the third quartile minus the first quartile. Actually, it is the range of the middle 50% of the numbers. Okay. A value is suspected to be a potential outlier uh, if it is less than 1.5 IQR below the first quartile or more than 1.5 IQR above the third quartile. Potential outliers always require further investigation. Okay. So how to do the... Q, uh, five number summary, which is minimum X, Q1, <laughs> then median Q3 and maximum is shown over here. I will also provide some YouTube video links. Okay. And then we are going to talk about box plot. Box plots, also called box and whisker plots or box whisker plots, give a good graphical image of the concentration of the data. They also show how far the extreme values are for, from most of the data. A box plot is constructed from five values. Minimum value, first quartile, median, third quartile, and the maximum value. To construct a box plot, use a horizontal or vertical number line and a rectangular box. The smallest and largest data values label, en label the endpoints of the axis. The first quartile marks the one end of the box and the third quartile marks the other end of the box. Approximately the middle 50% of the data fall inside the box. The whiskers extend from the ends of the box to the smallest and the largest data values. The median or second quartile can be between first and third quartile or it can be one or other or both. The box plot gives a good quick picture of the data. You may encounter box and whisker plots that have dots making outline values. In those cases, the whiskers are not extending to the minimum and maximum values. So here is a box plot. So <clears throat> the whisker on the left ends on the minimum value, it starts from the minimum value. The left boundary of the box is the first quartile. The right boundary, solid boundary of the box is the third quartile and the vertical line inside the box represents the median. The whisker on the right extends to the highest value or the maximum value. The two whiskers extend from the first quartile to the smallest value and from the third quartile to the largest value. The median is shown by a dashed line. It is important to start a box plot with a scale number line. Otherwise, the box plot may not be useful. Okay, how do we construct this as a box plot in our, uh, with using our calculator? So first we have to enter the data in L1 of the calculator. So we press the TI-84 I'm working with. So press the second button on the top left of the calculator. Then the plus button on the bottom right corner, bottom right corner on top of enter. So second button on the top left corner, then the plus button on the bottom right corner on top of the enter button. So second plus and then press number four. We will get clear all list on your calculator screen, which means that you have to now press enter to say done. That means the memories of the calculator have been cleared. Now you have to enter the data in L1 of your calculator. How do you do that? Press Tad button, which is in the second row of the calculator, then 1. And you will see the list, L1, L2, L3. Your cursor, black rectangle, sits on the first line in L1. Okay, now in L1 or list 1, we are going to enter these data set. 59, I type 59 on the first line, then hit enter. Then I type 60 and hit enter. Then 61 and hit enter. Then 62 and hit enter. 62 and hit enter. 63 and enter. 63 and enter. 64 and enter. 64 and enter. There are three 64s. Then there are 
465. 65 and enter, 65 and enter, 65 and enter, 65 and enter. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 actually. Now 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 actually. So, so far I've entered 464. Okay, so 65, again 65. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, then 65, then 65, and then 65. I have 9 65s. Then 266. And then 267. So I've entered this in this calculator, right? TI-84. Okay, 267. Then 268, then 69, then 70, 70, 70, 70, four 70s, then 271, then 72 and enter, 72 and enter. 173, 274s, 175, and 177, and enter. So I have entered all the data values. Okay. I might have missed one, so let me check on my numbers. Total should be 40, right? So let's go from the top and make sure I've entered all the numbers correctly. So 59. Then 60, then 61, then 262, then 263, then 364, then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 65, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 65 actually. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Did I do nine? Make sure I did it correctly. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, nine sixty five. And then 66, <clears throat> I missed a 67. How many times 66? Actually, 266. Then 267. And then 268. Uh, then 169. Then 170. Okay, 274, 570. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, 570 is actually. Then 71. And then 72. No, 72 is then 271. So it will be 271s. So it will be 271. So I have to clear this and then 271. And then 272s. 173, 274, 75, and 77. Okay, now I have 40 numbers. So I've entered the 40 numbers in L1 of the calculator. Then I will press the second button and Y equal to. Second button on the top left corner, Y equal to button is on top of that then press number one button plot one make sure on the first line it is on on okay and then you can go to the second line which is type and go to the fourth type of chart which will be a modified box plot in the sense it will show you if there is any outlier or not so put the cursor on the fourth type of chart and hit enter then do press the zoom button, which is the third key in the extreme row of keys, horizontal row of keys, extreme top rows. 
zoom button, extreme top row, third key, zoom, and then nine. And you will see a box plot just like what they have shown. Notice there are no boxes, separate boxes on the left of the diagram and on the right of the diagram. If there were separate square boxes on the left of the diagram, on the right of the diagrams, those would have been outliers. Hence, there is no outlier in this data set. Okay. <clears throat> Measures of the center of the data. The center of a data set is also a way to, of describing location. The two most widely used measures of the center are the mean and the median. To calculate the mean weight of the 50 people, add the 50 weights together and divide by 50. To find the median of the 50 PA people, median weight of the 50 people, order the data and find the number that splits the data into two equal parts. The words mean and average are often used interchangeably. The substitution of one word for the other is a common practice. The technical term is arithmetic mean and average is technically a central location. However, in practice among non-statisticians, average is commonly accepted for arithmetic mean. The letters used to represent the sample mean is an X with a bar over the top, produced, uh, pronounced as X bar, X with a horizontal line on top of it. The Greek letter pronounced mu, Actually, it's small m in Greek language, mu, represents the population mean. Notice mean begins with small m, letter m. So Greek letter mu is also m in Greek language. One of the requirements for the sample mean to be a good estimate of the population mean is for the sample taken to be truly random. So we need to take a truly random sample from the population so that the sample mean is a good estimate of the population mean. If the total number of data values in the sample is an odd number, the median is the middle value of the ordered data, ordered from lowest to the highest. If the total number of data values in the sample is an even number, the median is equal to the two middle values added together and divided by two after the data has been ordered. The location of the median and the value of the median are not the same. The uppercase M is often used to represent the median. So here again, we would have entered the data in L1, then stat, calc, one, okay? Then let's do it, okay? Let's do it without using the formula. So again, we have to clear the memories of the calculator. So I'm pressing the second button on the top left, second button on the top left, then the plus button on the bottom right. Okay, on top of the uh, enter button, second button, and then the plus button, and then the number four button will get me clear all list on my calculator screen, clear all list, okay? And I hit enter, done. Memories have been cleared from the previous problem. Now I go to stat button, press the stat button, which is in the second row, and then number one, which is edit, stat and one, edit. Your cursor or the black rectangle will be in the first line in L1, which is list one. Here I enter all these numbers, three, four, eight, eight, 10, 11, 12, 13, one, three, then one, four, 15, two times, then 16, two times, then 17, two times, then 18, then 21, then 22, then 22, then 24, then 24, then 25, then 26, <clears throat> then again 26 in the second row, then 27 twice, then 29 twice, 31, then 32, then 33 twice, then 34 twice, 35, 37, 40, 44 twice, and then 47. Okay. 
So calculate the mean and the median. So I've entered the data in mid in L1. All the data is in L1. Okay, you can see all the data in L1. Okay, now I press the stat button. Stat button here. Okay, then I highlight with the right cursor key calc. Okay, calc is actually the second one. So I highlight the calc stat and then calc. Okay, highlight the calc, which is the second one. Okay, and then I select number one. I press number one. Where is number one? One. Okay. Which puts me list is L1, first line. Frequency list is empty. And I go to calculate. So I bring the cursor down from first line to the last line, which is calculate and hit enter. Okay. So the mean is the first line. Okay. Is 23.575. Actually, 23.575, which is close to 23.6. To get the median, I scroll down. It is not in the first screen. So I scroll down with the down arrow key and I get MED equal to 24. MED equal to 24 in the second line, which is the median. Okay. Another measure of the center is the mode. The mode is the most frequent value. There can be more than one mode in a data set as long as those values have the same frequency and that frequency is the highest. A data set with two modes is called bimodal. Five real estate exam scores are 430, 430, 480, 480, 495. So both the numbers 430 and 480 occur twice. So those are both modes. The mode, mode can be calculated for qualitative data as well as for quantitative data. For example, if the data set is red, 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 green, green, yellow, purple, black, Blue mode is red because it appears three times. Okay, so here you look at the number that appears the maximum number of times. Looks like seven appears the maximum number of times. Four times seven is the mode. Suppose that in a small town, 50 people, one person earns five a million and the other 49 each 30,000. What is the median? So the mean is uh, you can calculate the mean is 129,400. What about the median? The median is the center is 30,000. The median is a better measure of the center than the mean because 49 of the values are 30,000 and one value is 5 million. The 5 million is an outlier. The 30,000 gives us better sense of the middle of the data. Okay. When, when only group data is available, how do you know the individual data values? We only know the intervals and the interval frequencies. Therefore, you cannot compute an exact mean for the data set. What we must do is to estimate the actual mean by calculate the mean of a frequency table. Remember, the frequency table is a data representation in which group data is displayed along with the corresponding frequencies. We simply need to modify the definition to fit within the restrictions of a frequency table. Since we do not know the individual data values, we can instead find the midpoint of each interval. The midpoint is lower boundary plus upper boundary divided by two. Okay, and how to do it? So here is a data set. So we have to find the midpoint of each class, okay? So let's see, oh, they did not, okay. So the midpoint of the first class is zero plus 3.5, which is 3.5. Zero is the lower class limit of the first class. 3.5 is the lower class of the second class. Zero plus 3.5 is 3.5. So 3.5 divided by two is 1.75 is the midpoint of the first class. The midpoint of the second class is 3.5 plus 7.5. 3.5 is the lower class limit of the second class plus 7.5, which is the lower cl class limit of the third class. 11, divide that by 2. And so forth. Okay, so you get the 
midpoints of each class, midpoint in each class, number of T-liners. So, it looks like the midpoints are, except the first class, are 5.5, okay, <laughs> uh, 5.5, then it will be 3.5, uh, notice the class with the 7.5 minus 3.5 is 4. So the next midpoint will be 5.5 plus 4, which is 9.5. Okay. So we can do it in the calculator. So each of the midpoints, the first midpoint is 1.75. Then it is 5.5. <clears throat> then it will be then it will be uh, <clears throat> then it will be 7.5 plus 11.5 is 19 19 divided by 2 is 9.5 so each of the midpoints are separated by a class interval with a class width which is 4 so the midpoints are basically not 1.75 for the first class is 1.5 then 5.5 then 9.5 then 13.5 and then 17.5. So let's go to our calculator. Press the second button, then the plus button on top of enter, then number four. Clear all this, done. Then stat and one. So the midpoint of the first class is not 1.75. We will enter this in L1 as 1.5. Next one is 5.5. Next one is 9.5. Next one is 13.5. And the last class is 17.5. So I entered all the midpoint values in L1. Then I will press L1, all the midpoints. Then I will press the right cursor key, right cursor key on the top right corner so that the cursor or the black rectangle moves to the first line in L2, where I will enter the number of teenagers or frequency, which is 3, 7, 12, 7, and 9. Okay, so again, midpoints in L1, frequency, corresponding frequency in L2. Then you press the stat button, stat button. Then highlight calc on the top row, like before, calc. Then press number one, one where calc, okay, or one where stats, okay. First line is L1, list is L1. Second line, frequency list, that's in L2. So I have to put an L2 in the second line next to frequency list. So I press the second button on the top left and then two, that makes it L2 in the second line. Then I go to calculate and hit enter. Okay, the mean is 10.76, 10.76. Notice is false in the class, third class between 7.5 and 11.5. Why? Because the frequency in that class is the highest. So the center of the data is between 7.5 and 11.5, which is 10.76. Okay. <clears throat> Skewness and the mean, median and mode. Okay. This histogram is symmetrical. You have, remember, <clears throat> groups on the horizontal axis, frequency on the vertical axis. If you look at the class with the highest height, which is centered at 7, its frequency is the highest. Look at the left of seven. Look at the right of seven. You have equal number of classes on the left of seven and on the right of seven. So it is a symmetric data set. That is left half of the data is equal to the right half of the data. In a perfectly symmetrical distribution, the mean and median are the same. This example has one mode, unimodal, and the mode is the same as the mean and median. In a symmetrical distribution that has two modes, the two modes would be different from the mean and the median. Now look at the similar data set here. Again, the groups on the horizontal axis, look at the class with the highest frequency, which is centered at seven. Look to the left of the seven. There are more numbers on the left of the seven or more classes on the left of the seven than on the right of the seven. So this is skewed to the left or left skewed data set. Heavy on the left side. Then again, look at the class with the highest relative, uh, highest frequency, seven is the midpoint of this class. Look to the right of it, look to the left of it, more data set on the right of it. This data set is skewed to the right or positively skewed. 
Okay. Measures of the spread of the data. An important characteristic of any data set is the variation in the data. In some data sets, data values are concentrated closely near the mean. In the other data set, the data values are more widely spread out from the mean. The most common measure of variation of spread is the standard deviation. What is the meaning of standard deviation? Is the average number of variation of a number in the data set from the mean. Average variation of a point in the data set of a value in the data set from the mean or center. Standard deviation measures uh, is provides a measure of the overall variation in the data set. The standard deviation is always positive or zero. The standard deviation is small when the data are concentrated close to the mean, exhibiting little variation or spread. The standard deviation is large when the data values are more spread out from the mean, exhibiting more variation. <clears throat> standard deviation can be used to determine whether a data value is close to the or far from the mean. A data value that is too standard deviation from the average is just on the bordering for what many statisticians would consider to be far from the average. So if a data point is located farther than two standard deviation, two times standard deviation away from the mean, then it is unusual. Considering data to be far from the mean, it is more than two standard deviation away is more of an appropriate rule of thumb than a rigid rule. In general, the shape of the distribution of the data affects how much the data is farther away from the standard deviation. Uh, procedure to calculate standard deviation, we will enter the data in L1 and then stat calc 1. Um, so, suppose I now have X and Y data, right? So, I want to calculate the stand, uh, mean and the standard deviation of data set in L1. Remember, my data set in L1 is uh, <coughs> all those midpoints, okay? What is the center of the midpoints, okay? So, I do stat, calc, Number one, one where stats, list is L1, remove the frequency list now. So uh, press clear in the second line. So nothing after frequency list and calculate. So you'll get the mean of the data set in L1, which is 9.5. Standard deviation is represented either by SX or Sigma X. SX is a sample standard deviation. Sigma X is the population standard deviation. Sigma is Greek small s. It's represented, it represents the population standard deviation. So if we know that a data set comes from a sample, we will use SX. If we know the data set represents a population, we will use Sigma X. Variance is the square of the standard deviation. This is the formula. Don't worry about the formula. Okay. So here the in fifth grade, uh, grade class, the teacher was interested in, in the average age and sample standard deviation of the ages of our students. So the following data sets are the ages of a sample of n equal to 20, sample 20. So we are interested in SX. Anyway, so we first cleared the data. So second plus and then four. Clear all list, done. Then stat one. In L1, I'm going to type in this information. 9, 9.5, 9 9.5, 10, then 10, then 10, then 10, then 10.5, then 10.5, then, 10 then again 10.5, then, 10 then again 10.5. How many 10.5s are there? 1, 2, 3, 4. How many 11s are there? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So 6 11s. 6 11s. Then 2, 3, 11.5. I'm entering all of this in L1. So I have 20 data points in L1. It's a sample data point. So I press the stat button, then highlight calc on the top row, then number one, one where stats, my list is L1. I go to calculate and hit enter. Okay, my sample mean is 10.525. My sample standard deviation is 0 
And how would I calculate variance? So I have to type in separately in the calculator, the sample standard deviation, which you can run round to 0.716 and then press the X square button. Where is the X square button? It's in the first column, halfway down and hit enter. The variance is 0.5126, okay. Again, you enter the midpoint. Find the standard deviation for the data in the table. The midpoint of the first class is 0 plus 2 is 2 divided by 2 is 1. The midpoint of the second class is 5 plus 3, 8 divided by 2. Okay and so forth. Enter the midpoint in L1, enter the frequency in L2, then stat, calc, 1, then your first line is L1, second line is L2, and hit enter. Okay. So, they're going, giving you a formula for the z-score, which is x, value in the, x is a value in the data set from which you subtract the mu, this is z score and divide by the standard deviation. Basically, z score tells you how far the data point x is away from the mean. If the z score is positive, it's on the right of the mean. If the z score is negative, it's on the left of the mean. So, z score tells you how many standard deviation the number x is away from the mean. If the z score is positive, the number is greater than the mean. If the z-score is negative, the number is less than the mean. So here you calculate the z-score for each of them, okay? So one who has got a GPA of 2.85. So 2.85 minus the mean is 3, is minus 0.15, divide by the standard deviation 0.7 and you get minus 0.214. So the GPA of 2.85 correspond, corresponds to a z-score of minus 0.21. What does it mean? It means the z-score of 2.85 is located minus 0.21 times the standard deviation below the mean, since it's lower than the mean. And what about for the all? It is 77 minus 80, which is minus three, Divide that by 10 and it's minus 0.3. So that means a score of 77, GP of 77 is 0.3 standard deviation below the mean. Since the first one is only uh, 0.2 standard deviation below the mean, the first GPA is much better because it's only 0.2 standard deviation below the mean, whereas 77 is 0.3 standard deviation below the mean. The more negative a number is, the more, the farther it is away from zero. Okay. And here are some known rules. At least 75% of the data is within two standard deviation of the mean, and at least 89% of the data are within three standard deviation of the mean. At least 95% of the data is within 4.5 standard deviation of the mean. This is called Chebyshev rule. The advantage of Chebyshev is that it applies to any kind of distribution. It does not have to be symmetric. Whereas for symmetric, that is bell shaped data, these rules are valid. Approximately 68% of the data is within one standard deviation of the mean. Approximately 95% of the data is within two standard deviation of the mean. And more than 99% of the data within three standard deviation of the mean. Okay. So, I'm going to stop here today. If you have any question or comment, write me a note. I'll get back to you as soon as possible. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up. I hope you didn't quit in the middle because I had some important information at the end. Okay. So, again, thanks for watching. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up. If you like this video, please share with your friends. You and your friends, please subscribe to my channel by hitting the red subscribe button at the bottom right corner. 
And do not forget to check me out next time because I'll be back with a more interesting lecture or interesting solution to math problems. I solve all kinds of math problems in my channel. So please check out my channel and please subscribe to it. It's Math Science Topia. That's the name of my channel. Thanks for watching. Take care. Have a nice day. See you next time.